So, uh, we uh, discussed last time the correlations which can, or physical observables, uh, which can be uh, defined in quantum gravity. <clears throat> and the main point was that uh, local operators are not good for that, because uh, their correlation functions are not really a gauge invariant. Uh, <coughs> when we said, uh, okay, let's look at the integrated operators, so you take uh, some operators, let's call it Rn, and and define this uh, point independent operators. Then you can discuss, in terms of these variables, you can discuss various things. You also can discuss uh, the uh, which uh, th these things we, we called them uh, correlation numbers. I'm basically repeating what I said uh, yesterday. Uh, or you can define, which is often more convenient, uh, the generating functions for these uh, uh, guys. Uh, namely, you define a logarithm of uh, e to the sum over n, some coupling constant uh, gn over n, and uh, the outcome from the theory is just some function. The, the problem which we have to solve is to find uh, this function as a function of the coupling constants. Uh, that's one possible physical observable. Uh, now, uh, uh, there are others, actually I'm uh, repeating because I forgot to mention last time an important class of different observables. So what I did mention was that we also can uh, define conditional averages of operators. And that probably this, it's, as I said, you know, we uh, actually uh, coming from, uh, we, we started uh, this course with conformal field theory, and this conformal field theory is pretty much a finished subject. Everything is, there are no unclear points. There could be some more interesting formulas or developments there, but uh, the basics are well, uh, in 30 years it existed, is very well understood. There is no uh, mysteries there. Uh, while now we are passing to a new subjects which are much more recent and uh, therefore the, there will be a lot of gaps in understanding it, a lot of questions important questions which cannot be answered and so on, at the moment and so on. Um, the, the plan is to go from this quantum gravity to describe black holes, uh, to describe quark confinement and so on. But uh, as I said, it's not a complete theory. Uh, this complete theory does not exist yet. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, Correlation numbers, or their generating function, free energy. Uh, conditional averages, which we, which I simply, um, uh, simply mentioned, but we did not calculate. We did some calculation, and we'll finish it uh, for the correlation numbers of the minimal models. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, there are no. In well, th this requires more development, conditional averages. And uh, what I forgot to mention, there's also another type of uh, physical observables which are very important for gauge string dualities. Uh, and this are, these are uh, special observables uh, which apply to quantum gravity, uh, which is asymptotically flat or asymptotically curved uh, with uh, asymptotically de Sitter or asymptotically anti de Sitter. 
So, in other words, you imagine the class of spaces uh, which uh, at infinity approach one of the uh, spaces with high symmetries. Uh, the simplest, of course, is uh, the spaces which approach at infinity the Minkowski space or Euclidean space. And then you can define uh, what is called the S matrix. Let's start with the Minkowski. Minkowski case. Uh, you quant uh, and let's talk f f uh, at, the, at this point. I'm not. It's a g general discussion. I'm not discussing uh, simply the um, uh, two-dimensional gravity, but more general um, case. Uh, so the Minkowski space. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, quantize, say, in Einstein theory, we take metric tensor, we uh, look at the sm at small perturbation of the metric tensor, and then we have some, the Einstein action gi gi gives us some structure like dh square plus hdh square and so on. Uh, and as you know very well, it's, it gives us non-renormalizable theory, but that's not what, uh, that doesn't bother me at, the po at this point. Mm, what the, 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 the reason for this discussion is that uh, consider the green functions, the green functions for these fields, H. This is the field of the graviton. Uh, uh, this uh, functions um, are, uh, according to our uh, previous arguments, uh, these are functions of x, and therefore they are gauge dependent. So they are, by themselves, they are unphysical. Uh, however, mm, well, how can we make it gauge independent? when you have these green functions of the field H. Uh, what? Hmm? Oh. S some ob re re remember your, uh, uh, refresh your knowledge of quantum electrodynamics. What is in quantum electrodynamics I may be referring it too often to it, but it's kind of a uh, starting point for all for, for field theory. So, what is a, a green functions say of electron fields in in electrodynamics are not gauge invariant. Mm, they're, they're, if you simply change the the gauge for the photon, they will change. What is gauge invariant? What we do calculate and. Uh, well, that's one of the possibilities, uh, but in terms of photons, if I uh, want to calculate some, say, uh, scattering of photons on electrons, the Compton effect, uh, the S matrix, the, it mu in other words, it must be on shell, that's important. What does that mean? That this, uh, this, ampli this green function it depends on, say, you have momenta k mu here for the graviton, and um, if k mu k mu is a four-dimensional momentum, if it is arbitrary, uh, it's gauge non-invariant. However, if all k's k i square are equal to zero, uh, well, that is k i zero is equal to plus or minus ki. Uh, in this case, we can define the amplitude of the S matrix, which is the same, uh, which depends on k1, kn. Notice that this is the function if we have four dimensions. Uh, this is the function of uh, one dimension less. Uh, all k's are three-dimensional and independent. Um, and um, well, the how how do you, what would be the path to the proof of this thing? 
how would you approach if you are asked why uh, why it is so what would you exploit what kind of statements um, would show you that it is indeed gauge invariant Huh? Sorry? So you can check the Y identity of the, the what? Y identity. What identity is, of course, very helpful, yes. Uh, actually, what you have to test, uh, there are many ways. First of all, there are, there, it's not a single way. You, you have the photon propagator, and you vary it, uh, and, uh, which is delta mu nu minus k mu k nu divided by k square, multiplied by some arbitrary, uh, arbitrary function depending on k square. And you have to ch check that uh, when you vary, in any diagram, when you vary the function c, uh, the diagram doesn't change. Uh, I suggest you refresh it. It's some standard, pa standard thing uh, in quantum electrodynamics. In the usual textbook, as far as I remember, it's not discussed in this way, but it's very easy to uh, to do it this way. So that uh, consider this refreshing of your memory as an exercise, uh, namely prove that the S matrix, both in QED and in uh, uh, Einstein theory, are gauge invariant. Uh, so you you see that. Um, Things depend on the, the 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 reason why it is gauge invariant is that we imposed the condition um, that at infinity the space is flat here, and when it is flat, then you can have uh, energy momentum. You have normal uh, all normal theory. So you imagine uh, some. Uh, uh, strongly fluctuating space-time, which, however, uh, has safe haven uh, uh, at infinity. Um, and in this case, you can, it's it's very limited uh, setting, but in this case, you uh, can define the S-matrix. And actually, um, you repeat the, more or less the same thing when asymptotically, it's not the flat space, but um, it's, say, space of negative curvature or space with positive curvature, which is so-called ADS or DS. And then the S matrix is also a well-defined object mm -hmm. because you fixed things at infinity. Um, there is no gauge freedom at infinity. Uh, and in this case, that's something which we will be discussing later in this course, uh, the S matrix coincides with the correlation functions of gauge theory. And that's quite, uh, that's what is called gauge string duality. And that's a very important statement. <clears throat> in any case, I just wanted to complement uh, my yesterday discussion uh, with this somewhat unusual uh, type of uh, of, of physical observables. As you see, it's the question of physical observables is far from trivial. Uh, <coughs> by the way, um, energy and momentum, to, to uh, uh, complete this, energy and momentum uh, in, th in the theory of gravity is defined uh, when you only when you have asymptotically a flat or asymptotically DS or ADS um, uh, spaces. Otherwise, um, there is, uh, once again, because uh, it gives you a safe haven where, where you can put your, your instruments to measure the flux of energy or flux of momentum. When the, you have genetic space, there is no such safe heaven, so energy and momentum become, in a sense, you know, unobservable. It's, again, it's, there are many, many things to be added there, but we have to move forward. Mm. Um, 
All right. Uh, let me return to the to the point which at which we stopped uh, yesterday. Namely, we looked at uh, the complicated Feynman diagrams, mm. which are dual. So, first of all, we, we made a very easy but important uh, geometrical observation that. Uh, if we have a random surface glued out of the squares or out of triangles for this matter, um, then, uh, th th then and you uh, define the theory as, as all possible glue summation over all possible joining of these squares. Uh, then it's described by planar diagrams by, excuse by Feynman diagrams. And these diagrams will be planar diagrams if uh, we are interested in the Euler character of the surface, if we are interested in topology of a sphere. Um, so uh, we developed the method uh, for uh, finding the, the number of plane of the, these diagrams. What really happens is that uh, when we have a complicated, uh, some complicated gluing, uh, we have the sum, uh, the number of surfaces with given, of the given order multiplied by the coupling constant to this order. Uh, and uh, as we will see, uh, the while the total number of uh, diagrams uh, grows, uh, grows factorially with the order of the diagram. That uh, can be seen from the integral which I wrote for you last time or into by some elementary combinatorical argu arguments. It's easy to pick up the factorial, but it's more complicated to see the corrections. In any case, there is a huge difference between uh, uh, unrestricted topologies and the case in which we restrict topology so that Euler character is zero. The number of diagrams with uh, uh, Euler character is zero grows uh, like a power of A here is the number of vertices, number of squares and it will grow like n of a grows like a power of a. Um, and w w which means that at a certain point um, g0, the, this, this thing is convergent for small enough g0, but there is a radius of convergent, convergence. What do you think will happen uh, with the surface as we approach G0 to G0 critical. We will find this G0 critical momentarily, but let's first have general orientation. So what will happen near critical point with Feynman diagram or with random surface? Uh, you see it diverge, so it, it's getting, it will be a, picking up uh, more and more squares, the number of uh, squares forming the surface uh, will uh, go to infinity. Uh, and that's, the, or the final diagram will become dense. You see the lines are so complicated that it become dense and intuitively you can say that it will form kind of a surface uh, in, uh, in this space. Mm -hmm. We will clarify this in a moment. Uh, in any continuum limit. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what we are looking after, the continuum limit. Uh, but let's see how it, uh, all these words transform into the formulas. Uh, as usual in theoretical physics, you first have to find the right words and then uh, after that, try to transform it into right formulas. Usually you fail at some point, but sometimes you succeed mm -hmm. um, at some stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, 
so what, that's what we are looking for. We can't care less uh, of what happens when you have a number of just a few discrete triangles where the, the surfaces which you form is, uh, really depends on whether it's triangles. By the way, if we, are, if we do gluing with, uh, sorry, uh, squares, and if we are gluing it out of triangles, then what kind of Feynman diagrams we have? What kind of field theory we have? Phi cube. Phi cube, yes. Uh, and as we will see, it's, it just doesn't matter. As to be near the critical point, it's the same thing. The, you describe the same th continuous theory, <coughs> whatever you do with this. Uh, and one more reminder and um, about uh, yesterday. Uh, I tried to squeeze a lot of things in one lecture. Uh, um, is that uh, there is a well-defined well um, way to describe planar diagrams. Uh, namely, you have to consider the matrix field phi ij. Uh, it, 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 it is taken to be Hermitian, but that's not very important. Uh, it's just convenient. Uh, where, uh, but what is important is a large matrix. It's n by n matrix. And in the limit n to infinity, uh, you pick up finite diagrams, uh, only planar finite diagrams. Apart from this, that, that's a, that, that uh, was a nice uh, comment by Toft that this is so. And uh, it was useful for it is useful for uh, generally young mills theories for QCD and so on. QC in QCD, large n approximation uh, gives a pretty good uh, qualitative picture and quantitative to some extent. So it's, uh, the idea goes far beyond this, uh, mm, this thing. Uh, and we actually I actually claim that if you parameterize uh, phi by u minus 1 lambda u, where uh, lambda is is a diagonal matrix, um, then uh, you can write the, the, the measure The measure you can write as uh, it will be proportional if you integrate things which depend only on, on the eigenvalues. It will be proportional to lambda i minus lambda j square i less than j d lambda i's. Uh, and uh, uh, that's basically it. Um, and there's, of course, the integration over u, but our integrand uh, does not depend on u. So we are interested in eigenvalues. By the way, um, one uh, comment uh, about this formula, it's not really, it's, a, it's an easy formula. It's not easy and important formula, which I recommend you to derive for yourself by changing variables. Um, and it's very widely used in group theory. Uh, to derive why it was first, I think, uh, discovered by Hermann Weil. Um, same name again. Uh, and uh, what I wanted just to comment upon is that uh, it had it. You see, it's singular when two eigenvalues coincide. Uh, why is that? To, to, I, I will help you with the answer. The analogous, this is precise analog of what happens in polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, we, we know that if we have the, the uh, uh, two-dimensional space, uh, you can write it down as RT, RT alpha. 
alpha is the angle, u plays the role of the angle, and r plays the role of eigenvalues. And you first have to understand why in polar coordinate at r equal to zero, uh, the Jacobian vanishes. r is a Jacobian for going from, uh, from Cartesian coordinates to um, this one. So why we have r, or r square in three dimensions? Uh, what happens at r equals zero? Why? Independence of all. Actually, well, yes. We, we know that uh, we have x r cosine alpha y is, oh, I'm sorry, x1, x2, r sine alpha. Now, you see that if r is equal to zero, uh, when you change alpha, nothing changes. You are not moving. You are not. You are staying at the same point. So, uh, to take into account this fact that at r equals zero, you are not really integrating over two-dimensional space. That that simply means that at r equals zero, uh, the measure should turn to sh should be zero. Now, the last uh, question is, uh, why is that? And that, that's pretty clear in this elementary example. It's slightly less elementary, but why, when two eigenvalues coincide, say yeah. lambda 1 equals yeah, lambda 2? Uh, yeah, well, what basically happens is that you take, if you take a unit matrix, there are many U's then it's, uh, we are not moving in the space of matrices. You, uh, when you rotate, when you rotate here, when you rotate uh, by alpha, the point r equals zero doesn't move, and so the measure of integration is zero. Here, when you rotate by u, the unit, the matrix with two coinciding eigenvalues, again, uh, it is. Uh, uh, nothing changes. So there should be proportionality uh, to the difference of all, all differences of eigenvalues. And that's the origin of this, of this factor. <coughs> okay, uh, uh, now the, uh, we still, uh, we, we wrote down the action last time. <coughs> which is which was uh, the following uh, uh, we had uh, the integral d phi uh, e to the minus n tri trace phi square plus g zero trace phi to the fourth if we wanted to we could just as well have phi to the cube it's just Whatever, uh, and all these guys, they they are uh, functions of radial variables. Lambda, it 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 is to be understood. I'm I'm basically repeating the same thing. That lambda here is the radial variable, while u is angular variable. Um, uh, so all these guys depend only on ra on on the eigenvalues, and so we get uh, the following integral Um, now notice uh, that the overall scale, the natural scale, for the for what stands in the ex in the exponential, in the ex is just n square. You have the factor of n here and n different eigenvalues here. Uh, so you have n square here and you have n square here. Uh, and at large n, you are allowed to um, actually use the saddle point approximation. Um, 
And as I explained last time, you are, you, uh, it would be an error to use the saddle point approximation here because you have too many small fluctuations, n squares small fluctuations, but it is correct thing to do in this form after you eliminated uh, angular variables. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gives us a simple equation and lambda i plus, uh, I, I shall divide it by 4, plus g0 lambda i to the, four, to the cube is equal to uh, uh, mm. So this is the equation, and we have to go to the large n limit in this equation. The way to do it is uh, simple. Everything at this level, everything is quite simple. Uh, it's quite elementary. Uh, you introduce the density of the eigenvalues, and I will I will go fast here. I will save some time for a really non-trivial part of, of the whole thing. But these elementary calculations will go quickly through them. Uh, and then uh, you will simply have uh, the equation uh, that lambda plus, uh, we probably can, should divide it by 1 over n, uh, lambda plus g0 lambda to the cube, uh, is 2 integral d mu rho of mu of lambda minus mu. Um, and that's the continuum limit of uh, this equation. Uh, now, it's an, and the problem is to solve it for the density of the eigenvalues. While knowing the density, we, we will actually reconstruct the easily reconstruct the uh, free energy of, and find n of a. Uh, the equation is interesting. Um, first of all, it, at, at the first glance, when you look at this integral equation for, for the density of eigenvalues, it seems it cannot be solved because at large lambda, uh, this uh, uh, this goes to zero, the integral is, uh, goes to zero at large lambda, while this grow, goes to infinity. Um, how, what do you think, how to resolve this strange thing? That the, this integral, if it is convergent, is certainly vanishing uh, at the large lambda. Mm -hmm. Principle huh? No, no, I don't mean that this is principal value. All right, yes. The, I'm, I'm talking about something else. Um, that, that's, that, that's, this is easier. It's clear that uh, we have a, a, a approximation of this sum by the integral involves this principal value. The problem is that this integral, it, 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 if we assume that it converges so everything makes sense, uh, seems to be the function which goes uh, down with increasing lambda, while on the left-hand side we have a polynomial. So it seems to be a, uh, an impasse here. Well, it's resolved in an interesting way. It's resolved by saying that uh, rho of lambda is actually non-zero only for the finite interval from minus a to a. And this equation should not be applied. Uh, there are simply no eigenvalues outside this interval. So uh, what uh, you uh, come to is that, by the way, the same equation and, and, and this interval should be determined from the solvability of this, uh, of this equation. 
There is an interesting analogy, which I don't think is uh, of notice. Um, there is a, s almost identical equations arise in the following problem. Mm. When you have a, some solid state and you applied some uh, force which trying to uh, uh, w w which is uh, directed out outbound force, uh, then at some value of this force you form cracks in the material, and the integral equation describing these cracks is precisely this one. Rho is the width of the crack, and the fact that you have a finite interval for the eigenvalues is simply the f and a are determined is simply that uh, the size of the crack inside of material is determined uh, but anyway um, uh, and uh, because of that the theory of this equation was is, was well developed long ago uh, i think in the 1920s uh, for, in the elasticity theory uh, anyway, how to solve it? Quite elementary. Let's uh, assume that uh, the eigenvalues form a continue, they are continuous on this interval from minus a to a. Uh, let's define the function f of z, which is integral from minus a to a. It's an analytic function, d mu, uh, rho of mu, uh, divided by z minus mu. Um, for, and it's defined for the complex. Uh, for it's, of course, the analytic properties of this function are that uh, they, it has the cut here. Uh, and mm, the real part, uh, uh, if we want uh, the uh, the real part of this function it's just the uh, principal value integral and so we have to find the function which uh, has the following property that the sum of uh, these things of here and here should be equal to what? from the equation. If we define this function, then you look at the equation and then uh, you immediately conclude what this sum should be. The equation? Left -hand side. Yes, just left hand side. So we have g0 x to the cube. Uh, and if we find the function satisfying this condition, then uh, the, the raw is simply the, it's proportional to the difference of these things. So you see it's uh, quite simple. Uh, the only way how to find this function and uh, the way to find this function is to guess that it is, it should be equal to mm, z plus g0 z uh, to the cube and it uh, should have uh, some some polynomial q of z multiplied by uh, z square minus a square. Let's introduce this uh, on z. Uh, Q at z is still undetermined. This function, as you see, uh, it has the right real part for z less than a. If we simply, uh, but you can say, okay, it uh, even if you um, drop this term, it has it satisfies this equation already. Um, now, uh, what? is from this definition there is you can see a condition which actually will determine uniquely this q of z. Uh, what's what condition what's extra condition as a function of z it satisfies?
And, uh, well, what about be the behavior at that to infinity? Which for? Hmm? A normalization factor. Yeah, it should go to zero, indeed, uh, because these integrals, when converged, it uh, simply, as z goes to infinity, it simply goes like 1 over z, d mu, rho of mu, from minus a to plus a. So, very simple. Okay, but how to, or, so if we simply drop this thing, uh, the bad uh, thing which will happen is that uh, we will satisfy this equation, but uh, we will not satisfy this condition. Um, so, but that actually gives us uh, the way to find the complete solution. And uh, you simply say that the leading term as z goes to infinity is z to the cube. So let's assume that q of z uh, is um, C1 z square, it should be uh, C1 z square plus C2. Let's look uh, in this way uh, 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 for, for this and that. That, that will be sufficient. And, and let's find C1 and C2 in such a way that they, will, that they cancel the leading b behavior and the sub-leading behavior. Uh, I suggest you do it yourself, uh, or look, there's a, there are plenty of reviews of, of uh, these matters. Um, I just want to give you a, the spirit of how, this, how to solve these integral equations. Uh, and that's precisely, and, and, and then from the condition that rho of lambda d lambda equals to 1, you will find uh, you will find determines A. So the size of the crack uh, in elasticity theory is determined by the, uh, by the integral equation itself. And here is the spread of eigenvalues. In any case, uh, there is a little, uh, little more algebra which I will not go into, which shows that the free energy has the singularity G0 minus, minus G0 critical to the power 3 halves. Uh, and that defines how the number of how the number of surfaces of given area grows with the area. Um, and uh, this you can compare with the calculation of the correlation constants uh, which goes from the side, uh, from the continuous theory side. Notice that there is nothing ma there are, and, yeah, to, to finish the logic, um, the, uh, as I said last time, it's the, mo the most surprising thing is that we have two equivalent, completely equivalent descriptions after number of works, uh, it's, well, let, let me put it this way. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, there, there, was, there are two approaches to the to two-dimensional quantum gravity. In one approach, you introduce the metric tensor and you uh, integrate Functional, you have functional integrals over the metric tensor, you have Feynman diagrams, and you manage to find uh, certain observables how, ob observables, how they scale, and so on. You get the answer for anomalous dimensions, very concrete answer, as we, as we saw. Um, and uh, that's more or less it. You solve two-dimensional uh, quantum gravity, where <laughs> the, the, the fundamental quantity was the metric tensor, quantum metric tensor. Okay, uh, now out of the blue, f 
from the totally different argument, we have uh, we, we say why not try to visualize fluctuating Riemannian manifold. Here we def define a fluctuating Riemannian manifold. Now we can say, let's try to describe it with uh, random gluing. And instead of the metric on one side, so we have a functional integral over dg, uh, sum over We will sum, uh, we, we take the standard object, a square or a triangle, and we glue them in a random way. And we define, we say that quantum theory tells us that we should do it in all possible ways. And there is some intuitive appeal um, saying that uh, uh, the, this, these two things are equivalent, but this is in no way proved. And actually, uh, I must say, I was very skeptical about this statement until uh, the results showed that all the numbers are the same. Uh, the situation even today is a bit strange. Uh, there's no doubt that this is the correct statement. Why no doubt? Because uh, people calculated dozens of non-trivial numbers on both sides, and they are the same. Uh, at the same time, one would like to have some controlled uh, analytic derivation from here to here and so on. And that's, that's not done. It's not, there are some promising attempt to do it a few years ago, but uh, it's still an open question why, why, why this happens. Whether this will happen in higher dimensions, for example, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Your, your G-critical is, is a function of the settle prime? Uh, uh, yeah, well, G-critical, exactly, there is a function, it's, uh, it's, uh, it comes, uh, the, the, oh. there is a critical, when you solve it, you will find that rho has a critical point, and uh, you need to go to this scaling limit to uh, get, uh, actually it will be only the vicinity of these points which will be important. Um, what, what do you mean? Uh, Dimensions. Excuse me? What do you mean in higher dimensions? Yeah. Oh, in higher dimensions, not here. In, in higher dimensions, we could uh, try, we, we, uh, we, we know higher dimensional Riemannian manifolds. We can define integral over metric tensors. And then we can try the same trick, namely, let's say, suppose we have ted, uh, elementary cubes. And we start gluing them. Uh, or tetrahedrons. That's the approach taken in uh, the so-called combinatorial topology. Uh, you, uh, in combinatorial topology, you actually uh, represent the manifold as a collection of uh, tetrahedrons. They're called simplexes. There and uh, and then you define various things. And it's, to some extent it was effective, but then it was replaced by much more abstract algebraic topology, um, which is more powerful. Mm. Uh, but uh, uh, so it, it, this topological part of the story is, of course, well, well, well worked out, but uh, we, we need much more than topology. This is integration of a metric. The question is whether integration of a metric is equivalent to random gluing in of, of those uh, simplexes. And the answer is, I don't know. <coughs> mm. uh, and in fact, uh, I became convinced uh, of equivalence only after seeing calculations here, uh, this side and this side. And by the way, the same is true for the modern, the modern version of this. 
Uh, as we will see, is uh, what is called ADS-CFT correspondence. And in this case also, the same funny situation that uh, no doubts that it's correct. Uh, too many coincidences. Everything coincided, not, not a single contradiction, like here. And no derivation from the first principles. Mm. It's still a challenge. <coughs> Mm. All right. Um, so uh, the I just gave you the taste of it. You can go to uh, various reviews to um, or to original papers to work uh, it out. Oh, there is one more thing concerning it. We're still not done uh, with this. Uh, namely, I concentrated here uh, on the case uh, of uh, Euler character equal to 2, or topology of a sphere, or planar diagrams, all these are more or less synonyms. Um, but uh, we should also sum over, uh, over uh, we don't have to, in, in the spirit of quantum theory, we should uh, allow all possibilities. We should not restrict uh, the sky. And um, if you try to uh, if we have mu this uh, g minus g critical, uh, we have various um, powers of mu coming. Uh, we, we found that uh, the free energy scales like n square mu to some power, which is which depends on the theory. Um, and uh, actually, it turns out, and that that's true as if, you, if mu goes to zero, but n goes to infinity first, if n goes to infinity first. Uh, now, what will happen in, uh, for higher uh, cases? Actually, Euler character can be written down as 2 minus 2h, where h is the number of handles you any two-dimensional surface is a sphere, has topology of a sphere with a certain number of handles. Not true in higher dimensions, but for two dimensions it's uh, very simple. Uh, and so you'll have a contribution uh, proportional to n minus 2h. And what is uh, what will be about what, what can we say about new? Turns out, again, we have an interesting structure, uh, totally coinciding with uh, what you derive from, uh, continue from the uh, continuous theory. Mm, we get the discrete theory. Uh, namely, uh, you have n square. Mm, uh, let me put it this way. The free energy has the structure. It, it is the sum of the terms uh, n uh, to the 2 minus 2h, mu uh, to the power, uh, what it will be, alpha. Uh, basically, I'm saying it's n mu alpha divided by 2 to the power of chi and some function uh, c of chi and sum over all possible chi's. So it is some function of this, of this variable n mu alpha divided by 2. And you get a non-trivial non function if uh, you keep this variable, say, let's call it x, fixed. So you tend n to infinity, mu to zero, in such a way that this combination 
uh, has the fixed value. And that's, in this limit, you get uh, fantastically interesting mathematical theory. Uh, some, mm, this is a non-trivial function. And uh, you can see that this, in this double scale, it's called the double scaling limit. And in this double scaling limit, you actually have again uh, the complete coincidence between uh, Riemannian theory or Einstein, Einsteinian theory of gravity approach and this discrete approach. Mm. Uh, you can calculate this, uh, these objects and they coincide. So the, to finish with this, uh, we have emerging uh, completely new view of uh, gra gravitational quantization of gravity, namely the discrete view in which, uh, which quite, in which you see there is no analog of metric tensor. The attractiveness, certain attract attraction of this view is that uh, you don't have, there is no gauge invariance, no diffeomorphisms, uh, or general covariance. There is no xi at all. The xi is some uh, artifact of the... You see, we struggled uh, in continuous theory of gravity uh, to find gauge invariant observables. On the discrete side, all you can do is to calculate... There is no such thing as... Uh, as non gauge there is no gauge invariance. It contains oh you can ask only physical questions and that's rather interesting. That's a good part of it. The bad part of it it seems to be in high dimensions seems to be completely and intractable so far. Um, although there there have been some attempts uh, to do numerical calculations with uh, these cubes or something. Well, but uh, it it remains uh, unsettled. <coughs> okay, um, we have to move uh, to the new subjects, all related though. So yes. Is it absolute value? Or? Uh, well, uh, it's actually, uh, to be uh, precise, you have to keep g smaller than g critical. Uh, and then take the limit. So it's uh, it's the limit mu mu is positive basically here. Um, so or if you define it like well, it, it as it is written here. Um, the, the perturbatively when you do perturbative calculations, you well, you see it's uh, it's, it's this way. Uh, I didn't mention it uh, yet, but uh, in, in the conform oh, I did mention it. In the conformal gauge, uh, the effective action, the vacuum polarization gives you the answer mu e to the phi. You see that for the theory to be convergent and to correspond to uh, those random, uh, random gluings, uh, mu must be positive, otherwise you have to analytically continue. You can analytically continue, of course, to negative mu, but uh, in, in this elementary exposition, mu was, uh, mu was positive. Uh, okay, uh, now we have to uh, go to go further and consider a uh, slightly different cases in which it's all uh, comes from we actually uh, looked so far to the we answered the question of how in two dimensions vacuum polarization creates uh, gravi creates gravity basically we created uh, we the induced action for gravity, then integrated over gravitational degrees of freedom and obtained certain results uh, which coincided with this discrete theory. <coughs> uh, 
Um, probably, as far as term terminology goes, it probably makes sense to uh, call, call these two approaches continuous theory and discrete theory. In continuous theory, though, uh, there is also some theory in between. You have the so-called topological field theory approach to this, uh, which tries to, up, to obtain uh, some relations uh, between the correlation numbers. It's also quite interesting, and also uh, the rules of this topological game are defined, topological field theory are defined, but the fact that it coincides both with continuous and discrete theories, it does, uh, but it's not derived so far. It's interesting that the foundation are not laid. A lot of results are obtained, but we still need some firm foundations. Okay, let me now switch to a somewhat uh, to the new subject, which is um, uh, the fact that uh, when gravity is present, and not only when in this case, um, uh, f uh, vacu the vacuum start may depend on the frame of reference. In different reference frames, we have v v v uh, we, the system may have very different vacuum. I shall explain what I mean. I shall explain it by, and that's the reason why I'm starting to discuss this phenomenon, because it will lead us naturally to two interesting physical questions, one concerning quark confinement and the other concerning formation of black holes. Um, by the way, it uh, should be clear that it's an interesting uh, testing ground theoretical laboratory, this two-dimensional quantum gravity, to study black holes, and we, to some extent we will do this. Um, to study, non, generally speaking, non-perturbative phenomena. Mm -hmm. Even though we have formally exact solution, it's far from trivial to extract black holes, to see uh, black holes uh, arising from those uh, uh, s small squares which we are adding together. <coughs> anyway, uh, let me g s s give you the first simplest example when the frame of reference uh, influences the vacuum. Um, consider a, a superfluid and, uh, or generally speaking, a fluid. And suppose we, ha we, we, we have a body which moves inside uh, through the fluid. Mm. Uh, well, uh, the body has some energy which depends on P. Uh, then uh, it's clear that there is a possibility that uh, this body will emit a phonon. If we have uh, sound waves here, it's possible that uh, there will be an emission. And uh, the conserva conservation of energy will tell us that it should be equal to P minus K plus C uh, and uh, we see that the uh, emission of phonon is possible. Well, let's take k to zero. We get uh, the condition uh, dE dP, which is the velocity of the body for any uh, any spectrum of the test particle, which we added, uh, we have v k equal to c k as the condition for mm, the emission. You see that if uh, v is greater than speed of sound, um, 
then uh, the emission is impo it's impossible to uh, satisfy this. Uh, huh? Oh yeah, sorry, then it's possible. I mean, if... Uh, 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 if V is greater than C, we can, we can solve this. Um, and that means that uh, the phonons can be emitted, and uh, that means that the body loses its energy. So we have friction in the system for V greater than C. And this friction, uh, these phonons will be emitted uh, by the uh, uh, if a cosine of the angle uh, will be just uh, uh, C divided by V, there will be a cone uh, in which, uh, defined by this equation, into which the phonons are emitted. And that's a pretty general phenomenon. Well, uh, by the way, this is uh, called the Landau criterion for superfluidity, uh, that if V is less than C, then you cannot, uh, uh, the body does not experience any resistance, because resistance means uh, emission of phonons or some other elementary excitations. Um, okay, um, there are other cases uh, of the same type. Mm. Can you name to me? some other examples where the same mechanism operates. Uh, where uh, you can emit things uh, inside the cone uh, for, for large enough cost. What? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the first thing... What? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Uh, so we have two things, um, not two actually more. Um, one is the Mach cone. When you have a super, uh, supersonic uh, object moving uh, through the fluid uh, and it produces two shock waves um, uh, and uh, radiates, uh, radiates sound. And there is also the, the Cherenkov radiation when uh, the, the, boy, the a particle moves with a speed uh, higher to the speed than the free speed of light in this medium. Um, but that's not all. Um, I, I will, well, actually you can observe this phenomena on Carnegie Lake. Um, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Mm. Well, not sure. well, if you have enough ducks there or geese, you can... Um, uh, actually, when they move... Uh, if Will they fly in, in those packs? No, no, no. When... Um, uh, Forget the ducks. I, uh, <laughs> uh, if you have a ship yeah, moving, cool. moving, there, is a, there are two waves uh, which you easily observe, and this is precisely the angle called Kelvin angle. It's uh, in this case uh, you have. Uh, it, it's of course not uh, the phonons which are emitted, but uh, excitations. Uh, which come when you have water, uh, then uh, there are surface waves uh, with a spectrum uh, proportional to 1 divided by square root of k. It's very easy to derive this, that on deep water you have this type of excitations. And, it, and for the argument, for the Landau argument, it doesn't really matter which type of excitation we're, we're dealing with. Which it, what matters is just the spectrum. That's one thing. Uh, there's, uh, it's not uh, the only, uh, we still have more. 
uh, by the way, I mentioned the ducks uh, because when they uh, fly and sit on the water, they start moving, and you see all this, this cone, uh, this Cherenkov cone, era, uh, behind the ducks. Um, mm. Is it because the water doesn't depend on, on the last? Yes. 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 Uh, the angle doesn't depend on the velocity. It, that's more subtle. For that, you have to calculate the uh, uh, the um, there is interference uh, going uh, between waves of different lengths, and you have to calculate the uh, by using saddle point approximation. You calculate the line of maximal intensity, and that's uh, what it will be. So it's uh, it's. I don't want to go into this, but that's more complicated. The Kelvin, Kelvin angle is more complicated, I think. <clears throat> um, and now one more, uh, um, one more thing is that uh, when you have a rotating black hole, suppose you have a rotating black hole, um, and uh, what can happen is that this rotating black hole will emit uh, radiation uh, and become start rotating less fast. Um, this is the phenomenon called super radiance. Uh, and it's basically the same thing. You have energy as a function of angular momentum and you uh, go to the lower level, and that should be equal to the frequency of uh, of the photon, and so approximately you get this relation. And but this is uh, just the angular velocity of angular rotation. So uh, when uh, you have uh, th there are some an angular factor which uh, actually show that uh, you can emit photons preserving energy provided that uh, the frequency of the photons uh, will be less than uh, angular velocity. And uh, there is also uh, and now I'm uh, that, that this, all these examples are well known. <coughs> uh, and we will have some general framework to describe them. That's why I'm beginning with um, concrete examples. Uh, uh, there's also, we can go slightly further, and we try to interpret this the same uh, th there's another phenomenon uh, for which it's not totally obvious that this is the same thing. Namely, mm, if, you have, uh, this is, uh, if you have a particle moving with constant acceleration, suppose you have some uh, object moving with constant acceleration, and you have some, some thermometer inside this object, it will show non-zero temperature. And that is called uh, the uh, Unruh temperature. Uh, and so basically it tells you that uh, in the moving, in the accelerated frame, you have not a vacuum state, but a thermal state. And I will clarify this a uh, little later. Uh, one more uh, preliminary thing. Um, Mm. One more preliminary uh, statement is that let's take a look, a, a slightly different look on the situation. Let's return to the superfluid. Um, we can say, uh, let's go to the frame uh, moving with the, with the fluid. That's, by the way, how Lando argued it originally. Then he said, um, the general formula for translating to the moving frame is uh, 
by the way, the easiest way to, uh, to uh, an instructive way to understand this formula is uh, to derive it from relativistic side. In the relativistic case, we have And when you expand in V, you replace the V square term, you replace E by, by the mass in non-relativistic limit, and you get this term. This term is corresponding to this one. This is instructive. It's a side remark because you see with Galilean transformations uh, from the group theoretical point of view, they are somewhat clumsy unlike the Lorentz transformation. They contain a central charge and uh, they actually are deformable. That was, uh, you, uh, we know now that we obtain uh, Galilean transformation by taking C to infinity. And that was, by the way, one of the argument Minkowski gave uh, that he said that uh, uh, Lorentz transformations are preferable because they are more genetic. You, are, you can deform uh, the Lorentz transformation, but you can deform uh, the um, Galilean transformation. Anyway, that, that was, th this is the formula from uh, classical mechanics. And now we compare two things. Mm. Uh, we compare two things. First, the, so the system in, in the vacuum. So we have... Uh, Let's return to the fluid at rest. We have the spectrum is, is this. We have the vacuum energy and we have uh, the energy the energy of one excited uh, quasi-particle, which is E0 plus epsilon of P, and the momentum is P. Uh, and this is of when the system is at rest, this is a higher state than this one. But now you see that uh, if we go to the moving frame, we get E0 uh, plus epsilon of P minus PV. Uh, and uh, plus, of course, mv squared divided by 2. And you see that uh, the creation of quasi-particle can reduce energy in the moving frame. That's essentially the point I'm trying to make now, although we are running out of time, I guess. Um, the point is um, that uh, the vacuum in one frame becomes unstable in the other frame. How to, we will discuss it uh, next time, but I just will finish with, uh, it sounds a bit mysterious, but the point is, of course, to concentrate on the boundaries. Um, in one case, uh, the fluid, uh, you start moving, going to a moving frame means you start uh, moving the boundaries, and in one case, the fluid follows, in the other case, it doesn't. And uh, that is reflected. So in one case, the vacuum is stable. In the other case, it is not. And it depends if epsilon of P minus PV is less than zero. That means that uh, the vacuum is unstable. And next time, we'll see the same thing happens with acceleration and with other frame, uh, cha frame changing. Um, that's this Lando criterion is just a tip of the iceberg. There are many phenomena behind it. Okay, but we are out of time. Let's stop here.